kind of in the middle of First John. Uh, but uh, if you remember, uh, the book of John was written to the body of Christ. And the problem was they had infiltrators in the churches. People that were coming into the churches, what we call Gnostic people, they were coming in and, and sowing seeds of false doctrine. And so John was countering a lot of the false doctrine. And that's really important to understand when, when we start reading his language. Uh, it, you know, if you just read it without that knowledge, you, you just kind of read it from your own perspective, maybe from your own experiences and things like that. But when you understand why he's writing what he's writing, you can understand the language that he's using and why he's using that language. He's trying to point out that there are some false Christians bringing teachings into the church. And so how do we combat that? How do we know the truth? And so I love John that he preaches just a really simple, simple message, but some of the deepest, most, most profound teaching that there is in the Bible. Just, just simple stuff, the way he, he lays it out. And so, I mean, that is, that's just the Spirit of God. And so, you know, that's, that's what all of us hope to do as, as ministers, is, is to take the Word of God and, and make it simple so that the baby Christian can even understand what God is speaking. And so, um, we're going to get into chapter 3 again, where we left off. And I'm just going to read uh, verse 5, which is where we stopped. It says, and you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not, and whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither knows him. So uh, he made, we, we're very clear in understanding Jesus came to take away our sins. Again, uh, reminding you, the Gnostics come in and say, you know, all things of the, the physical world, the material world, are evil. So Jesus didn't actually even come in the physical world. He, if he's God, he couldn't have come in the physical world. That would make him evil. That's what Gnostics teach. And then everything that's in the spiritual world is, is good. Uh, and so Jesus didn't really come bodily, they think. They, the Gnostic would teach. He, he just came in spirit. And, 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 so, and it's nonsensical because the devil's in the spirit world and, and demons are in the spirit world. So spirit, just because something's of spiritual substance doesn't make it good. And just, it's, it, just because something's of material substance doesn't naturally make it evil. Uh, and so we have to understand he's trying to combat thinking like that because the, the conclusion of this is, and, and we have a problem today with this as well, is that uh, everything that you do with your body, well, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's not the real you. So it doesn't matter. You can, you can live in sin with your body because your spirit stays saved. And so that teaching is out there even today under the, what's, what's called grace teaching. But, but that's not, just not true, okay? You can't do whatever you want with your body. Uh, and, and so that's why he's making it clear he came to take away our sin. It's, it, some people make it sound like it's okay to do whatever you want with your body. You can even sin, and you're good with God. No matter what you do, you're good with God. They don't teach any type of sanctification, any type of holiness. You're good no matter what you do because it's, it, sin doesn't actually like penetrate into your spirit. Your spirit's going to stay saved, washed in the blood. You're good forever. And that's, that's kind of a partial truth, of course. We are washed in the blood. We are stay, saved and, and so forth. God will never leave, leave us. He'll never forsake us. And we're safe in God's hands. However, that doesn't mean we're free to do what we want with our bodies. No, God teaches us to uh, lay our bodies down, be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, to, to carry the cross, to live holy and to live righteous and to, to do good works and so forth. So there is, and, and John's going to talk about this a lot, talking about what we do with our body, what we do on the outside. That's a demonstration of what God has done on the inside. So he's saying Jesus came to take away our sin. In him was no sin. Of course, he couldn't have had sin or we couldn't have been cleansed by his blood. We couldn't have been cleansed by the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if he had even the slightest spot of sin in him. But he was the only man that lived a life without sin. And because of that, he was able to take upon himself our sins. And, and there, the great exchange takes place where our, his righteousness becomes ours and our sins become his. He took our sins and the punishment thereof. We took on his righteousness and the reward thereof for all of eternity. 
So whoever abides in him sinneth not. Again, uh, there are those coming into the church saying it's okay to sin. So he's pointing out these people. Anybody that's coming in and, and say, you know what? Sinning is okay. They're not abiding in Christ. They're not in Christ. They are not born again. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither knows him. They say they know God, but they don't. And so he's making it very clear. Uh, so these are one of the tests. In fact, last time I, I spoke, when we first started the book of John, I talked about the test of salvation. And so these are the ways you can test and just no uncertain terms whether you're really saved or not saved. Or, or you know, so you can, you can see clearly, and, and I'll just go through these real quick. Uh, there are those that say they're saved, but they're walking in darkness. But those that are saved are actually going to walk in the light, walk in Jesus. Those are, so those that say they have no sin, when they do, for all have sinned. But the Christian who saved will admit it when they sin. And confess that it's wrong. It, it, was, it, was, it was a sin. The false Christian, the Gnostic, will say they know God, but they fail to keep his word as a lifestyle. When we, you know, we talk about, uh, we just read that you will not sin, the Christian, the Christian will not sin. It's talking about a lifestyle of sin. Will, will not um, enter into a lifestyle of sin on purpose. A Christian cannot, will not do that. Okay? Uh, it, it, not without some great uh, problems of, of, of their conscience and the Holy Spirit conviction. Um, I mean, you can do it. It is possible. But a normal Christian, is what he's talking about, will not go and enter into a lifestyle of sin on purpose. So a true Christian that's walking in the light is going to keep his word. The, the false Christian will say they're in the light, but they hate their brother. And we'll talk about that a lot tonight. But the true Christian loves his brother. A false Christian loves this world. The true Christian hates this world. The false Christian denies Jesus and or the Father. The true Christian acknowledges both the Son and the Father. And this is the one we're on tonight. The false Christian practices sin as a lifestyle, as a walk. And they think it's okay. The true Christian does not practice sin as a lifestyle. It doesn't mean that they never commit a sin. We're talking about a lifestyle, a habit that they're walking in on purpose. And then the last one we'll get to in chapter 4, the, whole, the, the uh, false Christian does not have the Holy Spirit, and the true Christian does have the Holy Spirit. So these are our tests of salvation. And so, again, these, these are just real clear ways to determine whether you're truly in the faith. You know, pastor talked about examine yourself. The Bible teaches examine yourself. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Uh, even today, we have uh, people in church calling themselves Christians that, that have not examined themselves and, and, and determined whether they're really in the faith. Uh, they're brought up maybe in a household that, that, was, uh, a, that always went to church, and so they just think, you know, I've, I've always gone to church. I've, I've become a member. I've become water baptized. I must be saved. Even some people think, just because I'm an American, I must be saved. No, being an American, being water baptized, being a member of the church, tithing, doing good things, none of those make you a Christian, okay? It has to be a change in your heart where you surrender your entire life to Jesus Christ. It's where he, he becomes your Savior and does a change on the inside of you. But not just your Savior, but your Lord. And this is where uh, some of the grace people have the problem is uh, they, they don't want you to uh, surrender your whole life in such a way that Jesus is your Lord. In other words, you don't have to live right. You don't have to live holy. You can live how you want. You're still good to go. Just, just you know, do what you want. Not a big deal if you sin. And, and that's just not true. So uh, the real Christian is going to make Jesus their Lord. That means I'm not in control of my life. I give my life to you. I get off the throne and I say, I bow at your feet, Jesus, and say, you take the throne, you tell me what to do with my life. And you surrender all. And that's the endeavor of the Christian walk. We, we endeavor to do that on day one. And we find out we're not doing a very good job. And so we endeavor to do that day after day. Surrender our life. And then stuff rises up that we see is contrary to God's word. To obeying God's uh, command. And we, when we're, we discover it, the true Christian will repent and admit and confess that that was sin. And, and turn from it. So again, this, this, is, this book is written uh, about, and well, it's two Christians about those that think they're Christians, but they're not. 
So, uh, you know, our, our modern day, what I call Gnostics, are, 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 are what I call some of the false grace teachers. They need to read this book. This book will determine, and, and, and we'll get into it just a little bit, but it's a lot about what you do that determines what's in your heart. So this is uh, going back to this verse. Who's, um, whoever abides in him, this is one of those in him scriptures, whoever abides in Christ sins not. Sins not meaning as a lifestyle. Okay? If you abide in Christ, and this is the wonderful thing, that, you know, we abide in Christ, Christ abides in us. He described himself as the vine, and we are the branches. That's a picture of like the, the grape. And so you have a grape vine, and you have these little uh, coily branches that stick out from the, the, the grapevine, and that's what produces the fruit. And so we have to stay as, as the branches. Jesus is the vine, the life, and we are connected by, uh, by the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ. The, the, the life, the sap that runs, that's what the, the sap represents, is the Holy Spirit that is now inside of each believer. The Spirit of Christ now lives in us. Praise God. So that is that vital life source, and we can do nothing without Christ. We can do nothing without that vital connection through the Holy Spirit inside of us. So it's just, a, as, as Pastor said, it, it's a divine entanglement that, that we are in Him and He is inside of us. Praise God. And that's how life is, is uh, produced. That's how fruit is produced. Fruit is that which shows up on the outside and demonstrates what's, come, what's happened on the inside. Praise God. So if you abide in him, you will not continue in sin as a habit, of a li as a lifestyle on purpose. And if you are doing that, I mean... There has been no repentance in your heart. There's been no remorse. You, you just live in a lifestyle of sin. Then, then you, you're not born again. Okay? Talking about as a lifestyle. You don't even know God. Verse 7. If I can find it. There it is. Little children. I like that. John always talks about uh, talking to, to the body of Christ. It calls them little children. Children. He, again, he is at, he's probably the oldest man on earth. I mean, he is really, really old considering the day that he lived in. I don't think most people live past the age of 35 or 40 in the days uh, of, of, the, of the New Testament here. So he's like close to 90-ish or, or something like that. He was very old. And of course, he's an elder in the faith. He's the, the last living uh, apostle to see Jesus Christ alive. And, and so he just speaks from that fatherly perspective, and calls them little children. And he says, let no man deceive you. And we all have to always be aware of deception, trying to get into the body of Christ, into the church's teachings that are contrary with God's word. And, and you must ask, you know, why would God even allow that? Why does God allow deception? I mean, he could just do anything. He could just stop it all. But things, we, we hear things, and and like deception and false teaching and things like that, it is a test of our heart. Are we sincere in our heart? Because it's real easy to lean over to the flesh and say, yeah, that sounds good. Let's run with that doctrine because it, it produces something that uh, excites the flesh, something that, that makes me rich and makes me powerful and makes me strong and makes me look good and, and, and all these things that are, are just external. They're, they're, they're temporal. They're temporary. No, we should... The true gospel is a gospel of the heart. The word of God is a gospel of the spirit. It is something that, that has an eternal value that doesn't exalt man. It exalts Jesus. It doesn't, it, it doesn't lift up man in any way and boast of itself and try to gain things for self. The, that which is a, a gospel that's selfish is not a, the gospel at all. A gospel that is a true gospel is a gospel that always exalts Jesus Christ, never man. And does all things for the glory of Jesus Christ. So let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous. Even as he, Jesus Christ, is righteous. Let's just stop right there. So this, this is a verse. He that does righteousness is righteous. Okay? Now again, John is trying to let the church realize who is among them. There are those among them that are teaching that sin is okay. 
well, they're obviously not righteous. They're saying sin's good. Sin's okay to do because it's only your body. It doesn't matter. You're going to stay saved because it's just your body doing the sin, not you. And John is sitting, sitting there telling you, no, those that are sinning, they're not born again. The born again people are the people that are going to live in a lifestyle of righteousness. This is not saying that, you know, we do righteousness or we do good works to get saved. It's saying we do good works as a product of our salvation. It's because we're already saved. A real Christian will produce good works 100% of the time. It might be very small when you're a just got born again, and, and it's very hard, like that, that seed in the ground that hasn't even started to come up yet. But you know if you've planted that seed, I do some gardening, you planted that seed, it's there. I don't have to go dig it up. I've planted that seed. I know there's something happening underground. And so when you first become born again, you might not be able to see all of what God's doing and, and, and the produce uh, of what God's doing. But there is something working. There is something happening. And so we, if you're a Christian, there will be a product, there will be a produce, a byproduct of your salvation is good works. And so those that, the Gnostic type teaching said, oh, you can't talk about good works. You're trying to uh, get saved by doing good works. And you're trying to get God's favor because you're doing good works. No, that's not the only option. I am doing good works because I've already got God's favor. I am doing good works because I'm already saved. Praise God. And, and the good works are just the proof that I have been saved. It's the evidence of my salvation. Hallelujah. And so we, don't, don't let them get you off track and say, oh, you're, you can't talk about good works. If you're not producing good works, you're not a Christian. Okay? This is the nature is to be like Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. We'll get to that verse in a little while. But he went about doing good things, right? He went about doing good works. He, of course, he wasn't doing something to get God's favor or to, or to get salvation. And, and we aren't either. We're doing it because we just, that's our, that's our new nature. We've been born again. We've been changed with a new nature on the inside. The nature of God has come inside of us and abides in us. And so we produce the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, all these things, self-discipline. So, um, he that, let's go to the next verse, he that commits sin is of the devil. Again, pointing out those among the, the churches that are saying sin's okay, he's just making a plain statement, they are of the devil. Okay, and, and again, we're, we're talking about a lifestyle, okay? I mean, even a, a Christian can sin, and, and, and John talked about that in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. If any man sin, so it is possible for the Christian to sin. Again, Gnostic teaching would tell you the Christian can't sin in his spirit, but he, but he can. When you sin, it is, all sin is spiritual at its root, so a Christian can sin, okay? So... This, this is the dividing line, and, and John just makes it real clear, real kind of black and white. If, if you're of the devil, this is the things you're going to do. And if you're of God, this is what you're going to do. If you're of the devil, you're going to live in a, in a lifestyle, a habit of sin on purpose. If you're of God, you'd never do that. Not on purpose, not as a lifestyle. doesn't say you can't make a mistake and sin. It's just saying that is not your intent, it's not your purpose, and that's, that's not going to become your lifestyle or your habit. So he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. And we know that. We know all the way back to the beginning, even the Garden of Eden. And, and at some point before the Garden of Eden, we know he had already fallen. He was, he was an anointed cherub at the throne of God. You know, we see the Ark of the Covenant or, or you know, pictures of it. And there's those two angels that are, that are kind of facing each other over the mercy seat. Uh, most people believe that one of those... Um, was, was Lucifer, was, was, and, and he eventually fell. And he got replaced uh, by another good one, by a good angel, of course. But nonetheless, that's what most people think he was. And, and uh, so uh, he, he had fallen. So uh, the devil sinneth from the beginning. He, he had fallen because of pride, because of his, his pride of his beauty, and his, uh, he apparently was a, a, a worshiper, and, and um, a, a number of other things. So he sins from the beginning, from before Adam and Eve. And of course, we see him in the garden as a snake. 
So he sins from the beginning. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so that was the verse I was talking about. Uh, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. In Acts 10.38, I'll just read it. He says, how God anointed with the anointing, the yoke is broken. The, uh, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. He had to be anointed. He, he didn't come as God uh, in, in all his glory and power on the earth. He, he stripped himself of all of those things and became a man, yet he stayed God. But he just stripped himself of all the power. But he regained power. How? It's through the Holy Ghost. And so by the Holy Ghost anointing him, he became the Christ. Christ just means the anointed one. So he is anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. But why? What was the purpose of it all? Well, here it is. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And so the same is true with the body of Christ. We have the same Holy Ghost, and we're supposed to be continuing the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus left, we know. He's up at the right hand of the Father in, in heaven, and we're here. We are continuing that work almost 2,000 years later, and we are to do the works of God. We are to do good works. Imagine if, you know, you believe in Gnostic thought, then, then it doesn't matter what you do with your body. And so nobody would do anything good because it just doesn't really matter. But no, God tells us to go into all the world and do something, to preach this gospel. He, go, he tells us to do something. He, sa he says, go make disciples, make followers of Jesus Christ who will follow me. And in following, a disciple is one who disciplines, one who disciplines themselves to follow someone. Uh, like, like an apprentice who, who works with a master, we are the apprentice, and we are trying to become like Jesus Christ. Not in our ability. It's the same way. It's by the Holy Spirit that anointed him. We've got the same Holy Spirit. So we become followers or disciples of Jesus Christ. And so it is our job to all of us do what Jesus did. You know, he destroyed the works of the devil. He came and destroyed the power of sin. Yeah, the, the devil is, is the one that wields sin and, and destroys the lives of every man on earth with, with the power of sin. So we come preaching the gospel, salvation from sin, repentance from sin. The devil destroys bodies with sickness and disease. And we come preaching Jesus is the healer. Jesus, hallelujah, we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover and in the name of Jesus, the, the devil comes bringing bondages and, and, and habits and addictions that people can't get out of. And we come preaching deliverance. We come preaching the power of God, which breaks the yoke. Hallelujah, which is the anointing. And we know, of course, it's not in us. It's by the power of the Holy Ghost that's in us that we lay hands on the sick or we preach this gospel or we... Uh, 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 minister and pray for people and, and, and direct them to the Word of God, which, which can break the yoke and set them free from on all bondages of all sin. Praise God. So we are continuing the work of Jesus. The Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil, just obliterate them. In verse 9, so whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now, the, the funny thing about this is this, is this is one of the verses that the people today that are teaching that it's okay to do whatever you want with your body, you're saved, you're good, doesn't matter. This is one of the verses they go to. They actually say, see, it says, uh, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. And what they mean by that is spiritually we're born of God. So it's impossible for your spirit to sin is what they, they're teaching, is what they say. Okay? That's not what it's talking about. It, it doesn't say anything about your spirit, that it's impossible for your spirit to sin. It it, it, it is. When you, you sin, it, it's you. It's you. It's your spirit. It's your soul. It's your body. It's all of you. It comes from the inside and the outside. Okay? So this, uh, if, you, if you don't go back and do some research or do some uh, study, it doesn't mean that it's impossible for the Christian to sin. Of course the Christian can sin. The word sin here is talking about, again, a lifestyle of sin. It doesn't mean that you cannot sin. It's talking about 
you, you will not enter as a Christian into a lifestyle or a habit of sin on purpose. So the irony is that uh, the Gnostics, modern day Gnostics, use this verse, but this verse was given to counteract the, mon the, the Gnostics of John's day and the ones today. The whole book was written against Gnostic teaching. But we can see how the, the devil can twist something and turn it around and make God's word say something that it doesn't say. So again, you always want to read in context, do some study. That's why the Bible says study to show yourself. We have to study because if you just read along the surface, you're going to get all mixed up. These verses are very confusing, particularly if you're uh, uh, to the newer Christians. They might read this and say, what? I, I'm a Christian and I've already sinned. Oh no, have, have I been lost? Am I lost? I've sinned since I became a Christian. And, and so they'll get all confused reading verses like these. So you, you got to do some study and you got to understand uh, every, every Christian has sinned. Since they become a Christian, I don't know of any that is, has, has been perfect. <laughs> no, we, we've all, even since becoming a Christian, have made mistakes and sinned. Okay? But our nature is to repent from that sin, to turn from that sin. Uh, but but we, we all have made mistakes. So it's not talking about a sin. It's talking about a purposeful life, lifestyle of sin. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. The Greek would make you know that it's, it's as a lifestyle, as, as a continual thing uh, on purpose. So, for his seed remains in him. Talking about the seed of God. We, we know we are born again by the word of God. The word of God is known as an incorruptible seed. That's in 1 Peter 1.23. He says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Corruptible seed means it can decay, it can die. It's impossible for the seed, which is the word of God, to ever die. It's vital, it's alive. That's what came into our hearts when we received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We are born of an incorruptible seed by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And because that word abides forever, we abide forever. Praise God. That seed in us uh, produced a born-again Christian, a believer. Remember, John, uh, Jesus said in John 6, 63, The words that I speak, they are life. Praise God. The word, Jesus, Jesus was the word. We understand he was the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word, is, the word is truth. Truth truth is not a thing. Truth is a person. Truth is Jesus Christ himself. The word is not a thing. The word is a person. Jesus Christ himself. And so again, we see this divine entanglement where the word of God, Jesus Christ himself, now lives in us. The, the spirit in us, we call him the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, but it, it's also called the spirit of Christ. And so that is that, that life that lives in each and every believer. Hallelujah. Born again by that incorruptible seed. The, the life of God dwells in us. Praise God. That's, that's, uh, that's an amazing verse. And I'll give you one other verse. And you don't have to turn here. But in Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verses 24 and 25, it says, He, God, is able to keep us from falling. To present us faultless before his presence with exceeding, with uh, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So not only do we become born again, but now God keeps us. Okay? He keeps us from entering into that lifestyle of sin. Uh, again, we can, we can make mistakes. We've all made mistakes. But he's talking about he keeps us from entering into that lifestyle of sin. You cannot do that without really fighting against God, going against everything on the inside of you, in your spirit, in your conscience, in your heart. God's speaking to you. He will plead with you and plead with you. He will keep you from that. And the only way you wouldn't want to do that is if you're, you know, you get into a place of total rebellion where you don't care about God, you don't like God, you don't care about the things of God, you don't value the things of God. You, and people have done this, and I, I think more today than ever before that I've ever heard of. We're in a day and an age where more people are falling away from the faith than, than I've ever heard of. Even pastors, even, even leaders, ministers, falling away from the faith, going back to the world, or going back into uh, false religions. Okay, this, this is the day that we live in. And of course, that's really kind of prophesied that these things would come. 
Uh, but, but we're there. And of course, we want to make sure we don't do that. So we got to have that, that seed that's inside of us. We, we got to stay connected to the vine. We stay in the Word of God. Hallelujah. And I, I don't mean as some kind of, of, of duty that, y'all, you just have to read your Bible. No, a, a real Christian is going to be hungry to read the Bible, is going to love getting in the Word of God, love hearing from God. God, I, I just love you. I just, Father, I want more of you. I want more of your Word. I want to know you more. A real Christian, that is going to be their response. That is going to be their nature, is, is to be like Jesus. Jesus is the one that cried out, Abba, Father. And so we do the same. That spirit that cried out, Abba, Father, in Jesus is now in us. Hallelujah. Now we've got to have, we've got to have more of God. We, we, we're not satisfied with where we are today. We've got to have more of Him every single day. And so that's the nature of the child. A, a child, when, when, you know, even naturally, we, a, a parent, a mother, and a father have a child, that child takes on the uh, characteristics of the parent. There's, there's natural characteristics. They look like the father and or the mother, right? They, they, or maybe the grandparents. But they take on the characteristics. And so the same is true with us. Early in the chapter, Jesus talked about when he returns, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so that, that nature that, that God has created in us as a new creature, that's going to be manifest on the outside at that point. So people can see the wonderful work that God has done on the inside shows up on the outside and we will be like him. Praise God. But understand on the inside, God has already done that work. We are like him on the inside and, we, and our goal in life is to, to produce that fruit so it shows up on the outside. So other people can see the love because we live in a dark, dark world and a dark, dark time in the dark world. In a time where people are all around us are in despair and depression and, and suicidal and, and crying out for help. And they don't, have, they, don't ha they don't know the way. Some of them are in other countries that never get to hear the gospel. There are people dying all around us. And so, uh, you know, they have to see something. Something that's real. Something that's not just words, but something that changes lives. And that is a heart that shows up on the outside and reaches out to them with love. And in this, the children of God are manifest. To manifest something means to show, to show outwardly, to, so everyone can see it. So the children of God are to be manifest. What you have, what God's done in you, is not to be hidden. City on a hill, right? The, the, the lamp is not to be put under a, a, a basket. It is to be manifest. And so who's manifest? The children of God are manifest, but John is also discerning how we can discern in the churches, in his case, uh, who the children of the devil are as well. So what does he say? Uh, it's an, another litmus test. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. He, I mean, he really just said that just a moment ago, but he's saying it again. He's, it's just a real simple statement. Those that do righteousness are of God. Those that don't are not of God. Black and white, real simple, straightforward. No gray, okay? You're, you're either of, of uh, of God's people or you're of the devil's people. They're, they're, that's the only two options. Neither of he that does not love his brother. Okay, so this is another one of those standards, which really he's already covered. Uh, do you love the brethren? That's another test of your salvation. It proves that, that you have been born again. Love, and we can see this, is something that's supposed to show up on the outside. Again, it's being manifest. So love isn't just something we say in words. It's fine to say them in words. But words don't mean anything if you don't demonstrate it. Real love is going to be always demonstrated, shown as an action, not just words. Now, if you love someone, you'll, you'll probably tell them you love them. Of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But we know also that uh, people can say they love you and they don't. <laughs> Uh, people, people can say they're a Christian and they're not. People can say any number of things. So it's also how you live. To say you do something, to say I love you, doesn't mean anything unless you also demonstrate it. Uh, faith without works is dead, right? Uh, be, be doers of the word, not hearers only. So our love, God, what God's done in us, is to be manifest so others can see it. It is not to be hidden, but you're to reach out and love people. Remember, Jesus is gone. We're here. So how are they going to see that Jesus loves them? How are they going to know Jesus loves them? We got to tell them about Jesus' love, that he died on that cross. That is the greatest demonstration of love that 
creation has ever seen. Everything was pointing to that moment. All the angels, I believe, were looking. Everything in heaven was looking at that moment. It's the greatest demonstration of God's love ever. And so they have, we have to tell the world. They're, they're in despair. They're in darkness. And they need to hear someone loves them. God loves them. And God's not angry at them. Uh, God is trying to save them. Because, you know, a lot of churches basically, they kind of bash people over the head. And, and, and then they, they start talking about, you know, God did this to you to, to, to teach you a lesson and, and, and really, really, really bad doctrines uh, that make people think, particularly, I'm thinking particularly of the doctrine um, where they say, you know, uh, you, your, your loved one died and your loved one died and, um, you know, God could have stopped it, you know. It, it, it's sort of like they say it doesn't matter what happens in this, in this world, good, evil, it was God's fault, basically. Uh, it, it, they make it sound like God is the author of everything evil that happens in this world. And, and I don't know, the devil's just kind of sitting around twiddling his thumbs. And so uh, w when people have this false doctrine taught to them that, you know, God uh, killed so-and-so and God put disease on so-and-so and God caused all this evil uh, and, and he could have stopped it, but he didn't. That, that makes people turn from God. They don't, they don't think God's not, God would be a child abuser. God, that's not our God. Our God is love. God is saving us from all the consequences of sin. He came to destroy the works of sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy the power. And, and our God is love. He's saving us from the wickedness that, that we see in this world and all the tragedies we see in this world. So, uh, we, we need to tell people God is a good God. I mean, we say it a lot of times in church, but do we really believe it? Do, do we really mean it? God really is good. God really is love. He's reaching out, trying to save humanity, not trying to destroy. Uh, Jesus came not to uh, uh, condemn the world, but to save the world. All right, so uh, let's keep going. Verse 11 for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. What message is he talking about? That we should love one another. This is the beginning of the gospel message. It was demonstrated in Jesus Christ. And uh, it's, it's really a simple thing, but it's, it's the most important thing. Love is the greatest characteristic of a true, matured Christian. Okay? A matured Christian will walk in love. Praise God. They will love the brethren. And we, we understand Jesus said, this, this was my commandment, that you love one another, that you lay down your lives for one another. In uh, uh, John 13, 34, Jesus said, a new commandment, it's a commandment, not just an option, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have, if you have love one for one another, okay? So love is the, the, the thing that distinguishes the true believer. The greatest thing, the greatest fruit, I, I should say, that, that proves that you're a Christian is you love the brethren. Of course, uh, you know, that's in contrast to the enemy and, and his people. Again, there's really only two races on the earth and, and the, there's, there's the race of the devil and their, their father is the father of lies and there's the race of of God's people, the sons of God that are right here on the earth right now, waiting to be manifested, waiting, waiting to show the greatness of what God's done in their lives. And so there's two races of people in this earth. And so uh, the, the distinguishing thing about God's people is love. If they've matured in the faith, grown in the faith, they're going to be lovers of people. They're going to be givers. They're going to be people that will lay down their life for other people. You know, all, you know I, I was thinking of, of ministers and, and Pastor Lincoln. You know, he was is, he is sacrificed and given up his, his life. He could have been in the world. He could have made lots and lots of money, gave it all up to follow the call to become a, a minister of the gospel. That's what you call laying down your life. And, and all of us have a, a place... In, that, that we have done that, and our, if we're going to continue in our ministry, we're going to have to do that in different ways over and over and over, laying down our life, giving of our, our money, our energy, our time our, to, to serve the kingdom of God, to, to do something for God. So we always are laying down our life, and I don't think, I don't know if it'll ever happen. It might be 
naturally we'll have to die for our faith. Some people have, of course, done that over the, the several centuries. Um, but but that's, that's love. Is, it's not out to seek for self. The world doesn't understand that kind of love. The world's love is, is more of a lust. They can't understand a self-sacrificing. Uh, you know, we see the contrast on the cross again where they were out to murder God. Well, God was out to give himself. That's love. The, 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 the cross is the, the penultimate example of the two races on earth. You got one race, the devil's people, trying to murder God. Murder is, is really the uh, greatest way of showing hatred. Okay? So you, you've got people that are demonstrating their nature. There's two natures that, that John is really contrasting here. The, the nature of the devil's people and the nature of God's people. And so we have the nature of God who lays down his life. The Bible says the, the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. We've got the same love that Christ had in us. We have the ability to forgive. We have the, the ability um, to do as it talks about over in uh, 1 Corinthians we have the ability to be patient. The world doesn't have that ability. We have the ability to be patient and kind. We have the ability to, to not be jealous, to not be arrogant and boastful, bragging about ourselves. The, the world can't do that. The world has to brag about themselves and be boastful and arrogant and proud. The world is easily offended, where the Christian should not be easily offended. If you are... Find out what God's done in you. Start, start believing that that love nature is inside of you. We have the ability to forgive. Oh, I can't forgive so-and-so. Yes, you can. If you're really a Christian, you have the ability to forgive. That love is inside of you, and you can do it. The world can't do it. They might say the words, I forgive you, but down deep in their heart, there's no change. There's no life. There's no, no life or connection with God in their heart. So they can't truly forgive. They can't truly love uh, selflessly. All their love is uh, trying to do something, trying, trying to gain favor. You know, the, even in even the world, we have what we call philanthropists, where they give lots of money. Oh, they're good people. They do good. Well, well, no, there's always a reason why. It's not because God's love is inside of them at all. They're doing it because they want to be seen. They're doing it for a tax exemption. They're, they're doing it for the wrong motives. That God's people, a real love is not ever going to do something for people to be seen. They're not going to do it so that they get some, some type of gain. They give selflessly. And that's what the cross was about, was Jesus giving himself and expecting zero from us in return. We don't pay him for it. We don't give anything for it. He just loved you and said, I laid down my life for you. Now come and follow me. I took away your sin on that cross. Now come and follow me. And we say, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. We needed it. Praise God. So this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. So we have a contrast here again, the nature of one people versus the nature of another. Cain was of the nature of the devil, of course who was of that wicked one who slew his brother. Okay, slaughtered, killed his own brother. Why did he kill him? Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Okay, so his works were a demonstration of what was in his heart. There was murder in his heart. There was hatred in his heart. There was a jealousy of his brother in his heart. So he killed his own brother. And the Bible is very clear. Hatred is murder as well. So hatred is just, if you hate somebody, that's murder. If that's in your heart, you are not born again. So we're seeing again the contrast of the nature of, of the devil's people. And their father, of course, is the devil. And the other race is God's people. And God's people do what Jesus did in the next verse. Uh, which, not the next verse, a couple of verses down. But he, he went to the cross. But I need to keep going. Verse 13 says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Okay, shouldn't be any surprise. 
particularly in this day, this is the, the greatest day of hatred against Christians I've ever seen that, that I, that's ever been recorded because it's not just like in, in certain countries only where it's kind of localized. This is a global hatred of Christians that we live in today, right? It's literally all around the world now. The mentality is the antichrist mentality, the anti-against Christ mentality, okay? This is a, a global thing now. The world hates us, and of course, that should be no surprise. It would almost be expected that the world would hate us. And we know, though, we, you know, they can hate us, but we know something. We know we have passed from death to life. You know what? You can hate me, but I still love you. But even if you never love me, if you never even like me, I don't care. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to have a relationship with God. I have eternal life in me. I know God. So I'm going to try to bring you with me, but if you're going to go your own way, that's your choice. I'm still going to heaven. I am living a life of joy. I'm living a life of, of such joy every day because I have a living relationship with the true and living God who came and died on that cross for me. Hallelujah. So we know we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren. Again, another test that proves it. It's really, again, a repeat of what he's already said. He's actually said it at least two or three times here. Because we love the brethren. No man who hates, or woman that hates a brother or sister in, uh, in Christ is even born again. They're not even a brother and sister in Christ, would they be? Okay. No, uh, uh, now, you, you might dislike somebody. You might not get along with somebody. But there will not be a hatred in your heart. Because that's impossible. Love is in our heart. And we might disagree, we might not like a personality, but I still love you with all my heart. If you do me wrong, fine, I'll still love you, I'll still forgive you, and not expect anything in return. That's the nature of the Holy Ghost living in our heart, God living in us. So that is the evidence that, that, that we're born again. He that loves not his brother abides in death. So you can abide in Christ, or you can abide in death. And, and it's no wonder that death will take over the, the, the spirit, the mind, and the body in someone that has a hatred and a bitterness in their heart that they won't let go. And, and bitterness and unforgiveness is the most destructive thing to the body and to the mind. And, and uh, so that person abides in death, just as the scripture says right here. Verse 15, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. So this is... Uh, fascinating. You don't even have to pull out a knife and go stab somebody and kill them or shoot them with a gun. You're judged by your intent. Your intent to just hate somebody. You might, uh, not you of course as Christians, but someone would never even have to pull out a gun and go shoot somebody. Just the intent in your heart is murder. Okay? That's the, the most destructive thing there is, is to want to go destroy someone else. All right, whosoever hates his brother, talking about in your heart, is a murderer, wants to destroy. And he just gave the example of Cain, who was jealous and wanted to destroy his own brother. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. It is impossible. Okay? Hatred of any kind is murder. Hereby perceive we the love of God. So again, making the contrast between God's people and the devil's people. How do we perceive God's love? Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Again, going back to love. It is the, this, the most distinguishing thing about a true, matured Christian is a life of just loving. Loving God and loving people. All right? That's how we can know a real believer. Whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother having need but shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the loving of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So John's all about showing. He showed us Cain had murder in his heart and so that's what showed up on the outside as his fruit. But then he shows us Jesus had love in his heart, and it shows up as him dying on the cross. And so he's demonstrating that a true believer 
is going to have an outward change. Your actions are going to change. You're going to, you're going to start, you're, you're not going to be there on day one or even close, but you're going to start changing the way you think, changing the way you talk, changing the way you treat other people. And eventually you start looking more like Christ. You start talking more like Him and acting more like Him until people can actually see Jesus in you. That's the goal. Oh, that sister is just so loving and so kind. That brother is just so giving. Pe people can start to see that that's a genuine faith. That's a genuine ch change that took place in their heart. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit. Well, the same is true of a Christian. People will know us because we are people of love. People that lay down our lives for other people. People that give. And so this is the example of that. A, a real Christian would have compassion when we have an abundance and we see our brother who has nothing and is in need and is asking for help. We would, uh, we would not be born again if we go, I don't care about you. I'm going to keep my own stuff. You know, a real Christian would never do that. Someone that has need and is calling for help, a real Christian is, is going to, if they can't help, always give. And, and, you know, of course we do that here as a ministry. We have a food pantry. Uh, but, but everything we do is about giving. It's, a, it's about giving the gospel to the world. Giving the, the very truth that saved us to the world. Everything we do is giving. It, it's, it's to be laying down our lives each and every day for those around us that are hurting, that are, that are in need. Spiritual need first and foremost. Speaking of spiritual things, uh, I also want to mention this intent of the heart, going back to actually the previous verse, I guess, to hate, that's a spiritual sin. God will judge that spiritual sin more severely and more quickly than just the outward sins of the body. So we, we need, uh, God judges the intent of the heart first and foremost. Spiritual things are far more important than, than natural things. Inner things are more important than outward things. So intent is important. So, the, the believer will have the intent to give to someone in need. There, there might be times they can't. Maybe they don't have something. They don't have any money at, at the moment or whatever. But in their heart, there's a compassion that, that wants to reach out and always give and love other, other people. So, that's how we can know the litmus, litmus test that we are children of God. Children of the God who is love. It's not just something He does it is the very nature of who he is. And so God in us, that love is now manifest. So that, hallelujah, we can look like Jesus. We can look like our Father God. And people can see Jesus in us. All right, so I'm going to stop right there at verse 18. We'll go ahead and prepare for the uh, tithe and offering. Praise God. Hope you got something out of that. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> we thank God for his word. We thank God for... Um, his son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us on that cross. If you would prepare for the uh, offering. Um, uh... Thank you for watching, and please subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.